Right, good morning everybody and welcome to the uh, uh, March board meeting of the CQC um, here in Newcastle. We had a uh, couple of really good days, I think, um, a number of colleagues meeting, uh, both our own staff here in Newcastle, uh, but also many providers and commissioners and uh, other people working in the health and care sector. So it's been a, a, a good couple of days so far. And I, I have to welcome uh, David, uh, heroically coming um, <laughs> uh, from London. Um, uh, we will somehow, David, despite the time pressures, find time for you to... <laughs> so, but that will, that will, that will be later. <laughs> right, so we have um, apologies from, uh, for absence from uh, Steve Field and Andrea Sutcliffe. Otherwise, uh, we are all here. Um, minutes of the meeting, 22nd of February, are they a true and accurate record of everything we discussed? Excellent. Um, the only item on the action log is uh, something which will come uh, and is due to come to our next board meeting, uh, so that's fine. Uh, is there anything arising that's not otherwise on the agenda anybody wants to raise? Okay, so Chief Executive, your report, please. Yeah, thanks. Uh, good morning, everybody. So, um, um, pretty standard report. Um, paragraph one is about performance, and um, just to note the um, completion of the uh, uh, primary medical services and uh, adult social care inspection commitments and um, uh, progress in relation to enforcement. Um, the hospital's director is uh, progressing with the independent uh, healthcare locations program and that's projected to complete by uh, the end of next week. Uh, report timeliness, as, uh, as you can see, has remained reasonably uh, stubborn, although we've now received the report that we commissioned and that's being considered and I'll come back to you um, when uh, I've got a readout from that uh, about the actions which we're going to take um, to actually continue to improve performance um, on, on that important issue. On registration, there is good news. I think they're showing month-on-month -month, uh, improvement in relation to the timeliness of registration, uh, and I think that is um, a reflection of some of the changes which have been introduced there over uh, the previous uh, weeks. Um, uh, an important figure, I think, in terms of our impact, which is uh, what happens when we rate providers inadequate or requires improvement when we re-inspect. And um, these are the f uh, holding the figures, uh, the figures that we announced in the State of Care report holding with about 47% improving the rating, 44% um, not changing, and 9% uh, deteriorating. I think the figure in the State of Care report was 8% deteriorating. Um, uh, you've got the state of care report later, I think, in a seminar, so I'll not repeat any of that. It's a report Mike published a couple of weeks ago. Um, Kate has been working with the Department of Health in terms of our budget, and the granting aid uh, for next year was confirmed uh, in a letter on the 14th of March. Uh, the figure for 17-18 is 34 million, so uh, that keeps us true with the fees we anticipate recovering of uh, a budget for. Um, next year of 226. Um, uh, we need to adjust that for the figure for depreciation which we previously discussed just for the sake of absolute clarity and transparency. Um, since our last meeting, the Chancellor has uh, uh, given his uh, spring budget statement to the uh, House of Commons and um, uh, we're just drawing an acknowledgement in this paragraph, really, between uh, the decision to invest an additional £2 billion over three years in adult social care. And I don't know that we could claim there is a direct link to the State of Care report, but I would like to think that um, we have had some influence on shaping the conversation that um, uh, led to uh, that. Later today, um, a letter will be issued to local authorities, which um, is still not in the public domain, but a letter will be issued to local authorities by the two uh, departments of state, CLG and the Department of Health, which will say a little bit more about uh, the arrangements for the advance of that grant to local authorities. And um, um, it will also ask us to undertake some work. So um, in, in public session, that's as far as I'll go, Peter, but um, perhaps later um, 
we'll uh, have more conversation in relation to that. But um, uh, the, to the best of my knowledge, the letter is not issued until later this morning. Um, and then the last item, uh, and just drawing attention to the staff survey, we've not previously reported the NHS staff survey in, in any of our reports, actually. It's gone into um, the methodologies that Mike and the team use, particularly in relation to the inspection of NHS establishments. But um, uh, this is such a significant uh, piece of work, a significant publication in relation to just how critical staff uh, engagement and staff morale is into the way that services are delivered, both internally in CQC but also in terms of other organisations. Um, so there is an annex to um, uh, this report which um, actually just pulls out uh, a number of slides. Um, there's a wealth of information here, so whichever uh, selection of slides you, you choose, um, you're going to leave something out. But um, these are particular issues that have um, been around in the NHS for a while. So we've looked at how many staff would recommend their organisations a place for themselves to be treated, uh, which I think is a pretty important indicator. But we've also looked at bullying, harassment, discrimination. Um, but then this important issue, which I think came out for a number of us yesterday, Peter, visiting the services, about the openness of the culture and how reporting incidents and how those incidents are then dealt with are actually um, dealt with within an organisation. And um, uh, I'm not going to present the slides. They're there for uh, colleagues to see. And then there isn't a slide, but the uh, very last paragraph in the report is looking at the uh, engagement scores. And the, very, I think, very interesting thing uh, in the debate about morale in the NHS is that staff engagement has gone up overall across the system uh, over that period since 2012. Um, I think this uh, uh, speaks a, a great deal for staff's engagement and the sense of purpose and motivation in their work. But we know how critical staff engagement is to the delivery of um, high quality social care. So um, I thought that was particularly um, uh, important figure to reflect. And um, uh, also interesting is that the highest engagement is amongst acute specialist trusts, uh, and perhaps in some respects not surprising, uh, and the lowest uh, was in relation to ambulance trusts as well. Um, so that's the report, Peter. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm sure my colleagues will be happy to answer any questions uh, on performance. Um, um, yeah, so there we go. Thank you, David. Lewis. Thanks very much. Um, the, I wanted to um, bring a couple of the findings together as a, um, a sort of question or suggestion. The, the, um, We've still got 546, is it? Let me just check. 546 organisations and special measures, which represents a lot of people getting care. Uh, and uh, alongside that, we've got um, less than half, fewer than half of the organisations that we rate as requires improvement or inadequate have improved by the time we re-inspect. And so those things have got to worry us. The, uh, the, 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 the difficulty of getting organizations which are poorly performing onto the, the next higher level. And understanding that, I think, has got to be one of our main tasks in the future. I think we're all agreed on that. And, and it, I, I, so first of all, I wonder whether we might need a, ourselves as a board a more detailed examination of that issue, because it's one of our most important. But also, just as a start to, this, to understanding it, that there are these really quite interesting relationships with the staff survey. Um, so. I, and, of course, it's possible to be critical of the, you know, the, the, some of the groups um, are relatively small. The numbers, the numbers are quite small. The, <coughs> the spread of scores, I imagine, is quite wide. But even so, there's quite an <coughs> interesting, reasonably convincing message uh, that the trusts where staff aren't, don't feel they're being treated well, are the, are the, those are the organizations that are also performing poorly on inspection. And so, by extrapolation, maybe those, those are also the organizations that don't improve very well the organizations that find themselves in special measures. Uh, and it might be that while we're puzzling over this difficulty of why don't organizations improve, why do so many, more than half, not improve, that this is a, this is a useful pointer to, to why that might be. It's the, uh, the sort of in, intractability of better staff relations, of staff feeling that, that their working life is better. Um, and I know that's just the NHS, but of course it could apply to other parts of the care system as well. So, um, so it's a double plea here. One is just 
can we have a further discussion about the, the, the problem of persistent low-level scoring uh, for trust, the failure to improve issue? Uh, and secondly, can we try to understand it better? Maybe taking as a starting point, what are some really quite interesting points about bullying uh, and about discrimination? Well, I think we should do that. I, I, um, I, I think you draw them together in the right way. I, I personally am um, rather cautious about the special measures. The vast majority of those are adult social care. And I have to say, as chief executive of this organisation, I don't know what special measures in adult social care actually means. So I just think we need to be really careful, but I think the general point that you're making about understanding those connections, the resistance uh, to improvements on why that happens, uh, is absolutely right, Lewis. Um, I, I, I think Mike will probably speak about the connection, and uh, we know that connections are on race, and we've seen that work its way through. We have no staff survey of adult social care. There's no way of actually comparing that, and I don't think there's any solution in sight to actually make that. So... Um, but I think you've got this afternoon, uh, uh, during the course of the time we're together today, um, the next stage report where one of the policy issues we need to address is uh, what do we do with organisations who continue to be required to improvement. So I think there's a, a policy decision to be made about how we address that, particularly in adult social care, I have to say, where um, some of the improvement uh, uh, resources are available through NHSI for NHS trusts are just not available. So I think there's a, uh, there's a, I, I, I think we need a differentiated conversation about requires improvements and special measures because it means different things in the NHS, it means different things in general practice, and it means different things in adult social care. But your basic point is, how do you understand those things that are resistant to change and improvements? Is absolutely right. Um, so we will bring forward uh, some analysis of uh, how we understand that. Lewis, I think you're making exactly the right links between the different um, the, the surveys and our, our ratings and our ratings on reinspection. I think the the good news is, first of all, that there are more respondents to the NHS staff survey. I think I haven't got the exact figure, but it's it's well over 400,000 people who now respond to that, and that is actually reflects the fact that more trusts are inviting all their staff to um, take part, whereas in the past it was often just a small sample. Um, I think it is encouraging, even if it's quite a small change, that there is in increasing engagement of the NHS as a whole, um, and um, that that is, despite the fact that it's quite a challenging time in the NHS, I think the two, two areas I would highlight. One is we are now beginning to see a, a limited number of trusts that have really gone up by two grades. Um, so uh, University Hospital Bristol going up from requires improvement to outstanding Morecambe Bay and Cambridge and Hinchingbrook going up from inadequate to, to good. Um, and I think we can learn from what's happening there and what it is that they have done. And, of course, the first one we saw was, was what happened at Wexham Park, where at Wexham Park... It wasn't just us that said things have got a whole lot better. The staff there were saying th 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 exactly the same, and the, the staff survey results changed dramatically uh, in the course of, of a year. And I suppose in terms of absolute priorities, uh, it is making sure that those uh, services or cells on the grid that we rate inadequate are dealt with, and those, which is why we go back to those uh, mo most quickly. So I think one of the other measures is to what extent are people um, at least moving from inadequate to requires improvement. I would not want to see them stop at that any more than you would, um, but I, you know, that is one of the first tests that we need to, to look for. Uh, yes, sorry. Um, thank you. I just thought really on the, the same theme, but, um, and I don't want to cast pessimism where we have celebration, but, um, and I, I'm not sure what the benchmarks are, but to find that our outstanding trust, there's a return of 21% of staff, that's a fifth of staff have experienced bullying or harassment from colleagues in 12 months, strikes me on, on the face of this as being a rather disturbing figure. Why, why is a an outstanding trust still got that problem? Now, it may be that I mean, could, there are various explanations. One is that it's actually correct and something of real concern. The other is that the definition of harassment, bullying and abuse has been a very wide range of things, and therefore um, it, it, it may not mean all that much, but in which case, uh, what, what do we do with the rest of it? Do you I don't know if we have a take on that. 
Robert, I, I would agree with you that a figure of anywhere near approaching 20 per cent um, is extremely unsatisfactory, and that is in our best trust. I think what at least we can say about that question is, again, there is the variation between acute trusts, let's say, and ambulance services. Um, Actually, in that particular question, mental health trust coming out slightly ahead, I believe. Um, and the, so we are able to use it for, as a comparator. Exactly how people choose to answer that question, of course, is up to them. Um, but I think it's the, it's the comparison between trusts that we can use. I would, I would very much like to see the best trust coming down from 20% to 10% or, or below. Yes. Do you mind if I just follow no, up on this do. point? Yeah. Uh, the, um, it's quite an interesting point because the, um, the, other, the other way of looking at this is there isn't a huge difference, even though there are differences. There isn't an enormous difference on most uh, items in the staff survey between the inadequate through to the, the, the outstanding trust. So um, although there is a pattern, which I think is a convincing one, um, it isn't as, uh, as big a difference across the rating levels as you might want. And in fact, there's, a, there's an impression that, that it's a little bit more discriminating at the bottom end. So that it's better that the staff survey is better at identifying, in other words, there's more low scorers uh, in the staff survey um, where the trust has been rated inadequate. It's a little bit less, less good at discriminating the outstandings from the goods. Um, so, it, so it may be that, um, uh, you know, I, well, I suppose you're right, that there's a, there's a sort of stubborn level of discrimination, a stubborn level of bullying across the NHS, which you don't find a huge variation in until you get to the bottom end of the, the quality scale. Do you, do you agree with that, Michael? I, I do agree that, I mean, obviously the, the, the number of outstanding trusts is relatively small, so seeing a difference there is, is going to be, be difficult, I, but I do agree. But between individual trusts, I, I think you, you would find that the range, uh, Robert's right, that the best is around about 20%, but the worst is still at about 40%. Um, and it's that variation between at an individual trust level um, that, is, that is most worrying. So, um, first of all, Lewis, going back to your, your, your sort of first and central point, we need to give some more thought to this. I mean, I, 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 I totally agree, and it does very much occur to me um, that as we develop our thinking on well-led, this, is, this, is, this needs to go into this because this is all in part about leadership and how you, as a leadership group, engage in your staff, set the right uh, tone and so on. So that's sort of the first point that occurs to me. And, and then secondly... Um, there are a lot of very interesting um, apps being developed um, about, that get to staff engagement that are very suitable to be used in quite small organisations as well as the big NHS trusts. Uh, and even in the big NHS trusts, I mean, a, a, an annual survey is fine, but actually I think the better trusts tend to do other things throughout the year as well. So I think thinking about what those things are, how they lead into, into leadership, how we can take note of how leadership uh, uses um, different forms of staff engagement tools and the information that comes out of that. I think that's all something that we need to come back to. So thank you. I think that's a, that's a good point. Um, sorry, Paul, go on. Can, can I change from that, that subject? Or, or? Yes, indeed. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. I, 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 yeah. Okay. I, was going, I was just going to go back to the internal stuff, actually, and, and um, just pick up on the... the uh, um, the operations performance, which I think is some really good news in there around productivity, around completing the programmes, etc. Um, the I was just wondering, David, whether you could say anything more about the project on looking at reports production, because that's the area which is still sort of lacking on that. And um, I'm wondering whether we're, we know when we're going to see the output of that consultant's work and when that will start to get in. So you saw my eyes, Dr. Eileen. I think I said I've not seen this yet, which is true. So um, Eileen, now. Yeah, I've had the privilege of seeing it, Paul, and um, it's a, a really interesting piece of work. Um, and uh, Mark Edmonds and I have suggested it ought to come to the board because it... Um, it sets out probably a lot of what um, individual directorates have thought to themselves already. So in as much as you're employing a consultant to tell you what you know, but it says it quite powerfully, and it's looked at the three inspecting director, directorates to see if there's any differential or where the commonalities are. Um, I think one of the most interesting things it tells us is about the, the span of time um, that exists uh, in the life cycle of a report where I think what fresh eyes have given is that actually 
we don't have necessarily a full sight of accountability or responsibility. So there is almost a waiting room that we have created ourselves. And I think the report is very powerful in the way that it sets that out. So I think bringing it back and um, having everybody have the opportunity to hear from Steve and Mike and Andrea about the way their directorates have uh, responded to it and engaged with it will be the next thing to do. Um, but certainly I think, you know, you always want to know, has this been worthwhile? And I certainly think it has been really worthwhile to have those fresh eyes and fresh challenge to us. Uh, just as a follow-up, because while we've completed the, completed the program of inspections, we've still got ratings to sort of get out on some, on some areas here. Um, and, I, and I guess the effort is now going into getting those, those, those ratings and reports out and finalised so that we've, we've got the, the complete picture. So, um, I, although I've not seen that report, and um, I, I think what we need to bring to the board is what we're going to do about it, um, uh, and that's where the focus should be. Um, but I know from Paul Elliott that, um, I, th I think I'm right in this, Mike, um, one of the mental health inspections, the team have just produced a report within 20 days. And they did that by taking a pre-populated template along with them uh, and a timeliness in the way that the team worked together to finalise the report. So, you know, I think the jargon will be, without mapping out the end-to-end -end process, what they've done is they've just really condensed it by doing everything they can up front and get into that. And um, uh, again, I think we need to take some of Paul's experience, who's really pushed uh, his teams on some of this and, uh, and actually got those improvements uh, as well. So um, I, I, I do think we're in a good position with the report that uh, as it works its way through and um, some of the experience coming from managers about what we can do to improve it to actually get into a better position. Um, and it might be worth, when we take the report, um, uh, Paul coming along to actually talk about some of the things that he's done to actually do that, because um, that's not dramatically changing the systems we've got, but it is about changing the behaviours that we've got to get that uh, through. So um, perhaps we might combine the two when we bring it back. Uh, David, um, just on, on, on the, um, uh, the, 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 the um, dashboard, uh, was showing turnover as red, and I think that's because we're still using historic targets. I mean, I, not for decision or now, but I would like to, to look at what we've got as the turnover target, because I don't think um, they should be red. Reasonable. Okay. So it, let's sort, sort the targets out, and then we can, we can get there. But that's for a future meeting. I, I, and secondly, just um, not in any way to contradict what you were saying earlier, David, but just for clarification, when you were saying you don't know what special measures means in adult social care, I think what you mean is you know the criteria for, for why, P, why uh, uh, providers are put into special measures. It's just that you don't know what then happens as a result of being in special measures. Yes? <laughs> uh, so, thank you, Parliament. So thank you for the opportunity to clarify. Um, <laughs> So the, the label special measures triggers NHSI to provide practical hands-on assistance and resource to trusts. Theoretically, there's a sum of £10 million that's available with the Royal College of General Practitioners that triggers some help to general practices, which are also put into special measures. In adult social care, an inadequate rating automatically triggers the special measures, but I do not know who provides resource to provide assistance to improve. So in a sense, it's duplicative of the label inadequate. And it's an automatic passport into. So, um, uh, 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 so my thoughts on this is it is just another label. Uh, but we've got a rating system, a four-point rating system, and it's um, a double rating system. Um, it doesn't trigger assistance in any way, shape, or form. Um, I think the reputational challenge to a provider, um, I was out on my uh, bike on uh, Sunday cycling around uh, the uh, Kent and East Sussex uh, uh, lanes, and I passed four care homes which had signs outside saying rated good by CQC. Uh, I think that's a reputational point, and um, I think special measures, uh, I don't think it adds anything to an inadequate rating. You don't go around saying 
rated inadequate by CQC outside of care home in the same way you don't on an off, uh, Ofsted inspection. Uh, so my point is, is what does it add? Good. Anything else anybody wants to raise on, on David's report? Excellent. Good. I failed at the start to, uh, to welcome uh, Steph uh, from Healthwatch Newcastle, and you are extremely welcome, and it's really interesting for us as a board to hear uh, not directly, uh, sorry, to hear directly from you rather than get reports through Jane and Healthwatch England. So, Jane, I don't know if you want to say anything by way of introduction to Steph, and then uh, of Steph, course. it'll be over to you. <laughs> and thank you. Pretty much said what I was going to say. But um, we were talking earlier on about improvement, and one of the things, uh, particularly looking at the hospitals up here yesterday, the outstanding hospitals, they're ones that listen to their staff and they also listen to people. They listen to their patients, their families, and, and the users. And uh, this is the, the plug for Health Watch uh, generally. Um, we're finding this is a really rich seam of positive information. It's a world away from just complaints or just uh, people getting very, you know, in a very difficult situation. This is about the practical and uh, rich information that people can bring. Normally, yes, you do hear from um, Health Watch England, which is a... I'd say a bit of pale echo. Uh, maybe we're a distillation. Maybe that sounds a bit better. A distillation of what's happening at local health watch, uh, where it's much more exciting and it's much more authentic because it's absolutely close to where the people are. So um, I am delighted to introduce Steph Aduse, who is chief executive of Health Watch Newcastle, and, um, and I think has growth opportunities as well. <laughs> so I'm going to let Steph tell you what's happening locally. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, and before I start sort of the, the proper presentation, just a, a couple of things really. I think Jane's absolutely right. Because in Healthwatch we go out and we seek views, we do hear quite a balanced view of the service. It's not just when people actually step forward and say something, and that does, it's more likely that that will be a complaint when somebody motivates themselves to say something. So by going out into all different communities and seeking people's views, we get a, a nice balanced view. And hopefully you'll see from the presentation one of the things that we're really keen to do in Newcastle is to spread best uh, practice. So we identify and celebrate good work and share that with others. I'm just going to move that away because I can hear myself. Um, so I am Steph Aduse, Chief Exec of, of Health Watch Newcastle and soon to be Chief Exec of Health Watch Gateshead as well. Um, we're really excited about the fact that we're, we're going to be running both Health Watches as separate organisations but joined. Um, we think it brings real opportunities in terms of consistency. So we have one CCG across Newcastle and Gateshead but two different Health Watch approaches so we can, we can make that very similar. But also, it means we can do more, we can have a bigger impact and, and, and hear more. So that, that's fantastic from our perspective. <clears throat> and I wanted to really talk about, well, what is the point of Health Watch? Um, are we superheroes, the Cape Crusaders, knickers over the tights, all of that type of thing that go out and save the day? Or are we mosquitoes? Are we these annoying little creatures that buzz around and nobody ever sees? And I think I would argue that we're both, but not for the reasons that I've given. Superheroes are um, there to champion. They're there to defend people who can't defend themselves. We believe that we're there to amplify the voices of people whose voices aren't often heard. And we're there to do good. So we're superheroes. But um, I'm half Ghanaian, West African. I'm sure any of you that have ever been in a room with a mosquito know, you know when there's a mosquito in your room. And they have a massive impact. And that's what we do. We're small, but you know we're there, and we are having a huge impact locally, so that's great. We don't have any of the negative aspects of mosquitoes, I hasten to add. <laughs> and maybe that's, like I say, that's what I want to talk about. It's about the impact that we're having. When we started Health Watch Newcastle, we spent a bit of time looking at what are the principles and values that we're going to base ourselves on. And these are really core. These are just a selection of some of our values that I wanted to highlight. Uh, we, we see ourselves as a critical friend. And interestingly, if we get a, a requires improvement or a, um, 
an adequate rating locally, we don't say, right, we're going to come in and find out what's wrong. What we do is we get in touch with the organisation and say, what can we do to help? What information, advice, skills do we have that can help you get out of the situation that you're in and improve the services that you're delivering? And that's gone down really, really well in terms of relationship building. And that final point around integrity, I think, is really important. So we do not put our health watch interests above the interests of the service users and the public. And we sort of we show through our behaviours that we are doing that all the time, and it means then we can shine a light on organisations when they're not doing that. So we've got a really good relationship with our commissioners and providers locally. Um, I even call some of them friends. However, I don't want you to, for a second, think it's a comfortable relationship. We are that bit of grit in the oyster. We um, sometimes have to say things that are very uncomfortable, and we sometimes have to say them over and over again. But by being that bit of irritation that's sitting there, that's, that's there to help, what we produce is something that's really good. Um, a couple of examples of work that we've done. Um, we've recently, in the last couple of weeks, and I've got some copies on the end of the table there, have produced a report on um, children and young people with special educational needs and disabilities and educational health and care plans in particular. We did that because the voices of, of these children, young people and their parents and carers are very seldom heard, particularly locally. We were hearing from them a trend of concerns about services and we knew that with the, the SEND reforms, there were new practices that had recently been introduced and we also knew locally that they were terrified because Ofsted is coming. And we thought this is a really good opportunity to use that as a lever to make a difference. We worked closely with commissioners and they actually sent our survey out to all of the parents and carers and um, young people who had a um, educational health and care plan or a statement, which is the previous version. And one of the things we like to do is we like to ask people for three words that describes their experiences because it's just a really good way of capturing what's going on. And what we found was a lot of what they said was positive. It was, you know, people were happy with the service they were getting and with the relationships that they had, but it wasn't all positive. As you can see in that word cloud there, words like stressful and confusing, as well as helpful and supportive. And when we went to the in-depth survey questions, um, we found that there were some issues that needed addressing, and we've produced some recommendations, I think it's about 12 in total, based on these areas. What we found is that this is like a drop of water in the desert. The, the commissioners and providers of services have soaked it up. Um, they didn't have this information. They really value it. Despite it only being out a couple of weeks, they've already met and started to prepare an action plan based on the recommendations. They have wholeheartedly accepted some of the suggestions that we've made, like having a single point of contact for parents to help them navigate through the system. And really exciting, they are planning to involve parents and carers in the development of the action plan, which we feel is quite a step forward from where we've been in the past. So we're immediately starting to see an impact um, from that report and, and really, really pleased with that. Another piece of work that we did, and actually two years ago I was stood at the Health Watch England conference talking about some work we were about to do on home care, um, and Andrea Sutcliffe was there. Um, so it's quite nice to be able to come back and tell you where we got to with this. So this report was published a year ago now. And we chose home care because, um, again, seldom heard voices. We weren't hearing anything. But also the people in receipt of home care are often hidden from view. It's behind closed doors, quite often they're housebound or, or very rarely get out of the home. So, so we felt actually we're concerned that we're not hearing anything. We were also concerned because we were hearing stuff nationally about things that were going on elsewhere in the country, but we didn't know what was going on locally. And we knew the service was about to be recommissioned, so again, we had that window of opportunity to make a big difference. Um, again, worked with our, our local authorities, commissioners, who were very supportive. In fact, I think when I said we want to look at this, um, the lead commissioner jumped out of her seat with joy, so that was, that was quite a nice reaction. Um, and they, again, sent all of our surveys out by direct mail, and again, we got a fair response from that. Three words again, 
And what that showed was people really appreciated the relationship that they had with their care workers and the service that they got from their care workers. We heard almost um, universal praise for them. There was very little criticism of the individuals delivering care. But there were some issues. And we came up with 10 recommendations based on those issues. The really exciting thing that came out of that was that when they developed the new specification, six out of those 10 recommendations were directly reflected in the new specification. When I say directly, some were almost a cut and paste from our report. So they, there's no doubt about the fact that they'd taken that on board. I would argue that the other four are inferred in the report. The commissioners have just come back to us and said, right, we're about to start this new service. We'd like you to talk to the new providers. And we want you to talk about your work, about the report, about what you found, so we can embed that whole culture and ethos right at the very beginning. Um, and we may well go back in a year's time and see what difference that's made, but it's a bit early at the moment. So we could just say, well, we're doing all of these reports, and every time we do a report, that makes an impact, and that's great. But my team at the minute is six of mainly part-time people. So the amount of work that we can do is not that great, and it's going to take us forever to change um, services in Newcastle if we just rely on the big reports. So we're really starting to look at cultural change now. These are all um, ways in which we've been described. I, I could have put honest broker on there as well, um, because that is probably the most common term that's used um, to describe Health Watch Newcastle. But it's really important that we are now seen as trusted partners. We are seen as expert advisors. We're connectors um, in the system, and we're seen very much as system leaders. If I wasn't here this morning, I would be sitting as part of the system integration task force that we have that meets fortnightly in Newcastle. Um, and my personal mission is to make Health Watch a bit like these poor animals, completely extinct. I don't want there to be a reason and a need for Health Watch. I want the organisations to do the role of Health Watch themselves. We are a long way from that. So I'm not sitting saying Newcastle's fantastic. Well, Newcastle is fantastic. But I'm not saying that services in Newcastle are fantastic because they're not. But what we're starting to get is phone calls that say, we're about to start looking at X. We've had some really early thinking about the way in which we might do that. What do you think? We want your advice on how we do that, and not just how we engage with the public, but about the whole approach that we're going to take. Um, how would you advise us to make sure that we're really capturing people's views and truly reflecting them? And that, to me, shows that we're starting to see that cultural change What's quite infuriating is that one part of the organisation will do that and the other part of the organisation will come to us with a finished plan and say we want to engage with people, which means we want to tell people about it. So we've still got a very long way to go, but we're getting there and we're having an impact. And that is the point. If we're just going out and hearing what people say and not making a difference as a result of it, then we're not doing our job. Just a few quotes there that people have given us. I love that last one from Gordon, who's a, a service user with learning disabilities. That's actually a comment from our conference last year, which was held across the road at St. James's Park. And we had a group of people with learning disabilities that came along to that conference and participated as delegates in the conference. I'm really proud of that. Thank you. This, listening to you, Steph, I can, I can endorse uh, your own self-assessment of being both a superhero and, uh, and a mosquito. <laughs> I, I can imagine you in both modes. Uh, that's really interesting and great. Thank you very much indeed. Does anybody want to ask Steph any questions or make any, in, in, any other comment? Um, right, uh, Malta and then Lewis. Uh, Steph, thank you very much. Really good presentation and great to hear about your work. I, I was wondering whether you could tell us a bit more about what good looks like from your experience about how Healthwatch and CQC work together? We have a regular meeting. We actually had one on Monday. Um, so there's the CQC, CCG, lots of abbreviations here, the local authority and ourselves. Um, and we sit together and we share information. And it's about us talking about, well, who's going to be the best person to get involved here? So quite often we may be discussing a care home. There's an issue in the care home. We've all got various concerns. So we kind of say we're hearing, we normally describe them as rumbles. We hear rumbles about something. Um, is it better that the CQC goes in? Is this something where we could add value? Um, and it's about that joint agreement of um, 
how best to approach an issue rather than us all just piling in or actually contradicting each other. Um, I think that's, it's really important that we don't contradict each other. Um, and as I say, some of the work that we've done, particularly with GP practices, around when we've had requires improvement ratings, going and saying, okay, so there's some real things here that relate to patient engagement. How can we help you with that? What are our feelings about the way in which you're doing things? How could you enrich that? I think that's really useful as well. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I like very much your uh, focus on people who don't normally get heard. Um, and so I want to ask you about another of those groups, which is people with um, mental illness, people under mental health care. So part A, if I'm allowed, is just a word about, about them. Um, secondly, I just, um, it's, it's quite interesting, isn't it, the number of uh, the response rate, uh, which you're rightly quite pleased about in the in this survey that you talked about. And yet, actually, it's quite a low proportion. Uh, and uh, I suppose we, we have got used to the idea that not many people contribute mm -hmm. in, directly. Um, and yet, so many people use... A service of one kind or another, and while they're using it, um, they usually have an experience that they think they, I think that they've got a comment on if you ask them, um, and they've usually got a little bit of time hanging around <laughs> when they could make that comment. So the ingredients are there for us to do rather better. I just wonder whether you've got any reflections on, um, uh, you know, getting these response rates much higher. Yeah, I mean you're right. We we. Um sort of industry standard it's fine the response rate but we're quite disappointed as well particularly with send actually we thought because that was quite a an engaged motivated group that we would have got a higher response rate and yet it was very similar so we were um disappointed but not surprised perhaps um with, with that one um one of the things that we do um to try and get more general responses is that we go out to people. So we do a lot of work going to where people normally meet. So we've been in supermarkets. That's an interesting one because you see a completely different demographic if you stand in a supermarket. Um, but we also go to groups. So we'll go to mothers' groups. We've been to lots of men's groups because we never hear from men. Um, we always get really low response rates from men, so we're about to start going to pubs during the day because that's a completely different demographic of men, but we've been to things like men's sheds, um, to young father groups, um, so uh, sports clubs, wherever we, can, we think that men might congregate and, and might talk to us. Um, You've got to be careful in Newcastle because uh, there's other places where men might congregate on Friday nights. But, um, but we also have, um, we've gone to just sort of knit and natter groups. So anywhere where people normally go. And what we find then is that's when we get that more balanced view of what's going on. Because people, people aren't coming to us. They're not sitting having an immediate response to a health service. What they're saying is, well, I really like my GP, but you know what? see my dentist isn't so great or I really love my dentist but the last time I went to hospital last six months ago it was like this and we get quite a nice view of what's going on in the system so we find that works quite well. We've also developed an app so about capturing that slightly younger demographic and the good thing about that is you're sat in hospital, you've got the app on your phone, you're, you've got an experience that's either great or not so great, what are you going to do? You can give instant feedback, and we have a, a system on our website which is a bit like a um, TripAdvisor type system, so people can rate um, the, the service that they're experiencing in the moment. Um, around mental health, we've done a lot of work with mental health, but more as part of the system. So there was a huge review of mental health done in Newcastle and Gateshead last year. We're about to move into the delivery phase, and that's one of those times when people are coming to us and saying, we're about to move into the delivery phase. We're not quite sure what the delivery phase is. Can we have a discussion with you about how we structure that? Um, we go out to select priorities every year based on trends and, and issues that we've heard, and we ask the public to prioritise them, and then we prioritise them at the conference as well. Mental health is on the shortlist again. I expect it will come out top of the list. It did last year. We chose not to do focused work on mental health because we just finished a major consultation this year I think it will be very different. Um, I think it's fairly likely that we'll be concentrating on an aspect of mental health um, locally. Great. Sorry, Robert. Uh, firstly, inspirational presentation. Thank you very much. Um, you slightly hinted at this in relation to the team you have is obviously very hard working, but volunteers and so on. Um, 
Do you have a comment you want to make about the resources available to you, uh, and insofar as you think they're either good or bad, what lessons you might draw for health watches around the country? Yeah, we've, we've been lucky locally. We haven't had our budget cut yet. I think it is coming, but we haven't had it cut yet. Um, it's not huge. And I know when I'm sat around the table with other chief execs and directors, I'm probably on about oh, a quarter of the salary that they're on. Now, I'm not running a multi-billion, million-pound organisation. However, um, that there's something there about this, the, the um, level of person that you hope to attract to an organisation. We do get very frustrated because we can't do more. Um, we have a population in Newcastle of 290,000. And as I say, we have one full-time member of staff and everybody else is part-time, and there are six of us. Um, I know that locally some health watches are being severely cut to the extent that I am concerned that they can't do their work. Now, we're very resourceful and we're, you know, we're having conversations about can we share back office functions such as they are and how can we work together and how can we do bits of work that bring in income. And we're having to have difficult conversations saying, yeah, we really want to help you, but it's not part of our core work, so you're going to have to give us a bit of funding to let us do that. Um, but it's not. It's not sufficient, and I think it reflects the fact that um, I don't think still nationally that it's valued. Um, I don't think that engagement and involvement is valued. Um, it's always the smallest chunk of the pot, and it's always the last thing that gets considered. So, yeah, we would love to have more resources, but we continue to do the best that we can with what we've got. Steph, I think Robert said it um, perfectly. It was inspirational. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, I'm not sure we can give you any more money, but we wish you, um, <laughs> <laughs> we wish you every success. And thank you for thank you. both the presentation and indeed everything that, that, that you do for Health Watch and the people you serve. Brilliant. Board, is there any other business that the board wants to raise? Uh, board, first of all. Um, uh, right. Uh, yeah, 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 but you're not on the board yet. <laughs> right. So, in that case, um, uh, why don't, Steph, why don't, no, what, st well, I think we're going to need that seat at the end for, aren't we? So, so if, if you and Catherine want to, to change places without falling over the wire, um, Really complicated. Musical chairs taking place. Thank you, Martin. <laughs> right. On the basis, David, that you were here first this morning, we'll give you the first we'll give you the first shot. But don't worry, Sam, we'll come back. You get second shot. <laughs> I mean I didn't know you're both you're both heroic for coming. It's just that uh, but, Yeah, you, we, we we recognize that. It's just that you were here first, David, so off you go. Thank you very much, Rob. Um, <clears throat> um I am um, uh, very pleased to be here uh, with you this time. I'm, I'm always, um, when I listen to the CEO, uh, CEO's report, uh, uh, there are important matters in it, inspection, the keeping up to the level of inspections, timeliness of reports and so on. But I always have this sort of feeling, yes, but are they really finding out things that really matter? And the answer comes back, yes, of course, the things that are matter. And I'm talking mainly about adults, social care, as I always do. Um, obviously, it is important that the records should be kept up um, properly. It is important that the medicines should be carefully monitored. It is important that people should not be given the wrong medicines, this sort of thing. But uh, as you know, many of the people around here have received some research which I did last year um, uh, showing that um, there are a lot of cases where the CQC um, uh, is, not the peop is not the body that actually discovers cruelty and neglect. And there have been reports recently in the press which suggest that cruelty and neglect in care homes and in home care is quite extensive. And yet, it somehow or other, it isn't you, in spite of all the people coming to your national care centre, who discover this. Um, and if you look back to the previous inspection, very often 
um, you are you say that the home or the care, home care service is good for caring, or if you say it's required as improvement, it's often about something not related to the abuse. And I've been racking my brains, I suppose, for the last half year about why this is. And I, around Christmas, I was thinking maybe it was a high-level thing that you were saying that you couldn't, um, that you were frightened of care homes closing um, and because of your coming down too hard on them, and of course care homes are closing, and we need the care homes in order to get the people out of the hospitals. Um, but I've been assured that that isn't the case. I wonder if in fact it isn't a little bit more at the local inspectorate level, and I've got an example, well, one of my own, but I'll use one from fairly near here, from North Yorkshire, where... <laughs> People went to the local inspectors with actual footage, of camera footage which they'd taken, which showed abuse, and initially the local inspectors just would not look at it. That changed. In fact, they made an appeal higher up, and it was, um, and it was looked. And in fact, now there has been an inspection since, and I think maybe not for the first time, but it's uh, fairly unusual, the the, the use of the footage has actually been mentioned in the CQC report. However, there's been a best interest meeting for that particular victim since then, uh, and it's been decided that in her best interests, the camera should be removed. Um, and why? Because she would be evicted if it wasn't removed by the home. And that seems to be totally contrary to what you produced in what you published in October, I think is quite wrong. Um, but those are people with evidence, but of course in most people, uh, friends and families, don't really have the evidence. They're not in a position to get it. What they have is suspicions. They, the, the person they're visiting seems to be a little more fearful and so on. And they want to come to you with help. But they do not want to be told, well, thank you so much for what you told us. We are going to put it on file and we will look for trends. And the next time, maybe a year from now, when the inspector goes in, they will be given this information. What people like that, they are really worried and they want action. Now, I know you can't deal with individual your cases yourself, but you have influence. You can make sure that the local authority deal with this case. So... <laughs> That is what I'm, I suppose, at the moment, I'm pinning my hopes that perhaps you are going to be a little more effective in, how the, way, in the way that you deal with ordinary members of the public coming to you with suspicions uh, and with evidence as well. Um, I'm hoping that, uh, at the moment, I'm pinning my hopes on this Adult in Social Care Inspector Report, which will be coming out, I believe, in... In May, I'm, uh, I hope I won't be disappointed. With it. But I suppose I really want to make an appeal to you. I mean, it's very often said, um, you know, well, we all have to remember that we will be in care homes sometime. I think that's an appeal to selfishness. I would rather appeal to your altruism in the sense of supposing when you have retired or even died, people were to say about you, um, <laughs> these were the people who really abolished cruelty in care homes and in home care. And would you not be proud that that was what people said about you? So that's what I've got to say. David, thank you. We, we, we agree far more than we disagree, although that's not always evident, I know, from our discussions. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, just to, to, to absolutely confirm uh, the starting point that uh, our whole strategy of CQC, as you know, is to rely uh, uh, more and more on information from um, a multitude of sources, very much service users, but also other professionals, uh, social media, uh, the media, uh, commissioners, whole, every, everybody that's got a, got, got a view that, 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 that we do need to capture that. So we, you know, our starting point is, 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 is the same. We can't be everywhere all the time, uh, so we need to pick up the information from, from people who are there, and then we need to act on it. Um, 
how we do that, how we make best use of our resources is always uh, a, a, an issue. You referred to uh, a report, it's a consultation that will be coming out and that will be something that, that, that will be um, uh, you know, in, in discussion. As we ourselves um, develop our own technology and analytical tools that support that uh, technology uh, and then uh, our whole way of taking that, that data um, I hope we will get to a point where we devote more of our resources or the majority of our resources to where there appears to be a problem and we can do that on a timely basis. So directionally we're trying to move the same way as you um, and you'll just have to uh, uh, keep prodding us as, as, as we go along over the next uh, uh, couple of years because this is not something where there is an instant solution um, but I hope we get better and better at targeting our activity and targeting the, the really, really poor uh, standards of care, whether that's in a care home or, or anywhere else. So thank you. David, do you want to add anything to that? Um, well, uh, David, thank you for uh, going to the trouble to uh, travel to Newcastle uh, and um, uh, uh, for continuing to challenge us on this. Um, uh, uh, we are not perfect and we need to constantly work at how we can actually take this evidence. Um, uh, out of, uh, on our inspections, if we're in a care home for two days, uh, then that means there's another 363 days in the year that we're not there. And therefore, your point about being reliant on uh, information we get from others is absolutely key. Uh, so I think you're right to challenge us. Um, and, um, but what I would want to say, I think uh, in the last 12 months, we've done 3,000 responsive inspections, which were done as a result of people sharing intelligence with us, where the immediate follow-up was not, we'll monitor this, but uh, an urgent inspection was carried out. We've taken urgent action to close care homes and then got a probrium for actually uh, the speed at which those have closed because we struck the balance of uh, actually there is a risk to these residents if this home remains open. Um, so you're right to challenge us. I just want, um, for the record in a sense and for the board discussion, some acknowledgement that um, this action is taken. And I think later today as you go out in the call centre here, you'll get a sense of just how many safeguarding referrals come into this building each day, which have then got to be dealt with and either urgent action taken or uh, they'll be passed on to the local authorities. So I think the challenge is uh, a good and appropriate one. Um, I don't want in any way to be um, defensive about this. And uh, Steph, I think your presentation where you talk to the CCG, the local authority, yourselves and CQC, and I think, uh, I forget what phrase you use now, but just talking about, was it rumblings? Rumbles. Yeah, rumbles. Um, I thought was a um, completely unscripted point about how when we've got some stability and maturity in relationships with uh, local partners, exactly those conversations uh, can take place. And um, um, so I, I do think your challenge is a good one and um, uh, we need to constantly work at that. But um, I, I wouldn't want people to go away with the idea that um, uh, an awful lot of our activity is not focused on the feedback that comes. Um, I'm not sure I would want my epitaph to be uh, that. Um, I'd, I'd hope it was I was a good dad or something, personally. But um, um, when I'm doing the job, uh, uh, please continue to challenge us. Michael. Yes, I, I'm very sympathetic to, uh, to the point David made. I also think it's uh, terrific that both of you have come to uh, this meeting I, I do wonder whether we need to be um, we need to set a standard um, for care homes as we do and Dave and I were discussing this yesterday um, we published a consultation on learning disabilities registering uh, the right support which actually set out very specific uh, conditions under which we would register um, housing for uh, people with learning disabilities. So there couldn't be more than, I think, five or six uh, people in a unit. Um, we said you couldn't have campus-type um, accommodation for people with learning disabilities. So with learning disabilities, we have taken a very tough line 
in saying these are the standards and we won't register um, again, you know, Dave and I discussed this yesterday, we almost won't register um, a provider who doesn't meet those standards. Now the question is whether there's a similar set of standards that we could use with care homes. They might be that every care home must have an iPad in their reception area on which, uh, through which relatives can make comments after a visit, you know, anonymous comments or um, personal comments. Um, maybe we, sh we should say that, you know, cameras may be very too invasive, but there's now devices like Cocoon, which are sound-based. Um, perhaps we can't say that uh, every care home should have a cocoon device in, uh, they're rather like nests for thermometers, but they uh, record sound or alert uh, sound. Um, we could at least say that every care home should allow uh, residents or relatives to put devices like this or similar devices. So I wonder whether there is a set of standards we could um, rather like we do with learning disabilities that we could apply to care homes. Because um, I do think David's point right at the end that we should become known for eliminating cruelty um, and you know, shockingly bad care from the sector is, is an aspiration I'm sure all board colleagues would share. Yeah, no, it's gone. Just, just very briefly. Um, first of all, David, I, th I think the, there's probably more agreement here than you might expect. I think that a lot of people have sympathy with what you've said. Um, uh, I think there is a difference between the difficult issue of predicting where something might be going to go wrong from less serious warning signs and the issue of responding once something has gone wrong. Those are, those are not identical issues, um, but they're both very important. Um, I do think it is something beyond I, mean, I, th I, th I think we I, I, I agree with Michael I think this is something that we could be stronger on although I wouldn't want to give the impression that we're not already very concerned about it but just as an illustration of this as a society wide problem um, we've been trying within CQC to get hold of the number of times that people are convicted of, of ill treatment of people with mental disorder so that's the part of the Mental Health Act, which deals with, introduced um, in, a, in the previous act, but reinforced in the 2007 revision of the act, which, if you remember, I had quite, quite a lot to do with, David, you remember that. Um, and we increased the penalties for people who were found guilty of, of mistreating people with mental disorder. And very often in care homes, that, that is the, 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 what people are charged with, because other crimes like assault are sometimes more difficult for various reasons, so that issue of... Uh, ill treatment of a person with dementia, um, is, it often comes under the Mental Health Act that, they, that that's pursued. It's been in incredibly difficult to find out just how many cases there are. Now, I, I think, as, just as, a, as a, a sort of snapshot of society not taking this problem serious enough, that's a very good example. We don't know how many cases there are. And CQC has been trying to find out that information from uh, the Ministry of Justice and hasn't uh, so far been able to find it out. Um, now, and it has in the end had to uh, put in a request under freedom of information from another government department to find out how often that happens. Can you believe that? That's how we've had to try and find this out. So um, I think there is a wider society-wide problem about the seriousness with which we take this issue. Uh, and uh, I maybe we could just reassure you, David, that uh, I, there are many of us who think CQC um, should uh, play a full part. Okay. Um, so, do, do you want to come in, David? Do and then, one and then thing. We'll come to um, so, j just important: uh, the um, consultation response on registering the right care Michael was referring to it earlier uh, is coming to the board uh, and is not yet um, uh, completed in its analysis. I I'll say something later during the course of today about uh, where we're up to. Um, so on Michael's point, I think it's still under discussion. We haven't got to a fixed position, but I think the principle behind it about how um, 
the, the, um, the clarity of the standards on which we'll engage is, is the key point. But um, the, the registration issue is, all, is still open um, until um, you bring back the consultation and then have the discussion and arrive at the fixed position. So um, um, Rebecca's advising me just to be clear about that. And I would have done it later, but uh, for the record, it's probably as well to do it now. So thank you. Um, you beat me She's too. not passed me the shopping list. It's what I'm effectively saying. <laughs> Sam, come on. Your, your moment. Good morning, board. Thank you very much for letting me speak. I have to say, Newcastle's an adventure. It's a long way to go. It's well worth it. Got a question. Um, a few things. <laughs> it takes a bit of effort to get a question in, David, doesn't it? Um, I've got a main question, but just a few comments on what you've been saying. Um, for this young lady here, just to say, and I'm not really being, I'm not being funny, but... When you go to Weatherspoons, different parts of the country, you always see older men sitting by themselves everywhere early in the morning. I've only seen, yeah, this, I saw one, one older man and one, and he actually brought a chess set with him. And he went from man to man, mm. bringing the chess set, trying to engage them, I thought, which was lovely for him and lovely for them. Mm. But just there is an awful lot of older men left sitting there with nothing. It's really quite depressing when you go past and see them. Yeah, okay. Um, Louis, yes, mental health standards, abuse of mental health patients. I know it's for, for dementia patients, but mental health standards are absolutely huge, as we know. Um, Robert, the bullying, I think, is over 65% rather than 21% from what a report that came out the other day. So it seems a bit odd if it's over 65%. It means people who are being bullied are bullying. That's what it read. The, that's what the figure came out of 65%, so it was much higher. Um, okay, so my question is on the CARE Act. Okay, wait, wait a minute, one thing. In your uh, lovely um, call centre in here, I rang the other day um, from a request on Facebook to ask for some information, and your Facebook group told me to ring the care centre, which I did, and I got a very nice man from Safeguarding, and they were really sweet, and he gave lots of information, so go Newcastle call centre. They were really sweet. Um, my question is, under the CARE Act, this, Mike, this is probably for you, under the CARE Act, what are the provisions for carer support groups in, so I know there's local services, LSU, MSU and High Secure, but are the, the MSU and the High Secure, probably the LSU as well, have different needs to ordinary carers groups? So under the CARE Act and under the CQC, are you now, is there a, a good practice guidance or any guidance at all about carer support groups within MSUs, High Secure and LSUs to give them within a unit, so as in a full hospital, not just one unit, but within the full hospital, a voice. Um, I was spoken to the other day by a member of a trust, and they said that another uh, unit had had a carer support group, but that all they did was complain. <laughs> so they shut them down. So I just wanted to know if there's actually a provision anywhere for a carer support group. We did ask for one, and what they said was that uh, they'd have to have a member of staff within the group, which sounded a bit more like intimidation than anything. Um, so they didn't want anybody to speak freely. So is there, is there any provision there for that? I, I have to say I paid notice of that question. I, I, I can't give you an answer to that, but we can okay. go away and, and, and find, find the answer out. Okay. Does anybody have any ideas? I think I was, Mike got in before me, so, and I was going to say that's the sort of question where okay, notice sorry, is helpful. Okay. So we will come back to you with okay. an answer, but it's quite a, quite a technical question. I mean, I do have the act with me, but I'm trying to... Oh, David, you know the answer. <laughs> So, so the Act is, re is very clear about carers' rights. It was another one of the sequences of legislation since the 80s which confirmed carers' rights. Michael and I were down at uh, Tees Eskenweir Valley uh, Trust uh, yesterday afternoon when other colleagues went up to Cranlington. And um, we spent some time for those people with learning disabilities who had been detained under the mental health legislation for assessments. And I don't know, we probably spent uh, a couple of hours, um, uh, or four hours there altogether, but a couple of hours in, in, in the units. And um, uh, what was absolutely clear from the, the, um, the way that the staff talked and uh, was about the way that they were engaging carers in the way that they operated the system. So I think it's le uh, we do ask in our methodology how are carers engaged, but um, I don't think there's a standard that's set about carers' engagement in medium secure, Lewis. I'm looking at you in relation to this, but I think there is an expectation in the legislation that carers are engaged. Yes, that's what I would have said. And, and I saw in what I thought was excellent practice yesterday, actually, Michael, that um, people in quite difficult and challenging circumstances, um, being uh, their carers being engaged, um, 
And there were some quite difficult issues. I mean, some of the young people in the units have been physically and sexually abused, so it, it raised a whole raft of issues about the appropriateness of engagement. But I think the pulse and the rhythm of that unit was um, uh, residents and... Um, uh, and their families were engaged, but uh, as, uh, as as Mike and Peter said, we'll come back to you. I think there is a there is a, an answer that we can give to that. But I, I think, think it'd be a good thing because I think practice is variable. I think that's yes. the issue. Yes, yes. I think the the um, what seems to be happening is that there there's a they're doing something around a triangle of care, which looks like it's going to be good and yeah. doing a template, but they're not when it actually when carers are coming to the service and saying to them, may we have a care or support group. They're actually deflecting and decoying away from it. So they're, they're saying they're trying their best to stop it and not to engage, but looking like they're engaging, which is really dangerous because but this is what's happening. You know, I, can, I can show it to you. But this is what's happening. So it's in one particular large trust with a very high um, mental health section. About 50% of their trust is, is mental health patients, forensic and otherwise. Um, they're saying it, but they're not actually activating it. They're not actually engaging. So the triangle of care that they're supposed to be in implementing is not really going to work in the same way without a care or support group to feed back in. And it comes back to the original thing with Robert, you, Robert, saying that the, you know, if a carer tries to report that they're putting the patient in danger. So the only way to really do it safely without any patient repercussions, if there's a large enough group, is to use a care or support group to funnel it, anonymise it, and then hand it over for action. But actually doing it one-on-one -on -one is leaving patients and carers open to repercussions, which is slightly a worry. The other thing is I wanted to know is, are the public able to get a template of your um, review papers, the way you do it? Like, I think it's, nobody's ever, I'm not, I've never seen it. So you know what you were saying about the templates, that they were filling it in, that uh, Paul Elliott was saying they pre-filled in whatever they could before they did it. Of that template that you use for review, is there anywhere to have a copy of that? No, sorry, I don't want to confuse. The template is um, well, okay. our report. It's our oh, published okay, report. Okay, all right. So, so, yes, you do get the template. We publish it. Okay. And is there a space to reply? Okay, we'll find a way, find a way to that. Okay. Uh, yeah, you, you can comment on our website. You could comment about an individual report. <laughs> okay. We Good, can. Sam. Thank you That's very perfect. much. Thank David, you. thank you as well. Board, thank you very much indeed. That's the end of the public meeting. Thank you.